London news agents. In your case, John O'Malley, for the offence of violent disorder, the sentence is 32 months imprisonment. In your case, William Nelson Morgan, for the offence of violent disorder, the sentence is also 32 months imprisonment. That sentence intended to reflect that offence and the associated offence of possessing an offensive weapon. The streets of Britain may have been mercifully quiet last night, but the wheels of justice are still turning on those who have rioted. Those two people, John O'Malley, who was 43, and William Morgan, who's 69 and had no previous convictions, can now look forward to 32 months in prison for their part in the riots that have swept Britain over the past 10 days. Decent people across Britain will be relieved today that the proposed riots, disorder that we all thought might happen, perhaps a hundred sites strong across the country, didn't happen. Had it done so, this would have been a summer of infamy, a week where we'd had the worst far-right extremist riots that we'd seen for decades. Why didn't it happen? And has the threat now finally gone away? Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Lewis. And a little bit later on, we're going to be talking to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, about the peaceful night that we've had, whether the danger has passed, the challenge to politicians to meet some of the concerns of people who do have legitimate anxieties. But also he talked personally about the impact that these riots have had upon his own family. But first we should discuss uh, the night that was, or rather the kind of the night that wasn't, because we had in the media and, and across the country as well, the government and the police certainly, who were well prepared for it, had anticipated partly through the interception of lots of kind of telegram chats, actually very well signposted kind of lists of events that were supposed to take place, as I say, perhaps as many as 100 strong across the country, had expected perhaps the worst night of disorder yet. And in the main, apart from a few scuffles here and there, it didn't happen. And it is interesting to sort of think about why that might have been. And I think, I mean, I was in, in Blackpool uh, last night, partly because we thought this was going to be one of the sites of, of disorder. There was an immigration centre there. Uh, the far right had suggested that there would be a problem there. And indeed, I think actually what happened in Blackpool last night was a good kind of microcosm of, of everything everywhere because there was there were people there. There were a few score, maybe yeah, probably about 50 or 60 people who turned up. Typical sort of people that you might think of and have seen on, on your TV screens and so on. You know, older men, mainly men, often accompanied by kids, which is always a bit sort of difficult to kind of get your head around, as young as 14, 13, 12, 11. And it was a really weird night, John, because when we arrived, we all said to each other, security we worked with before, uh, video producer Rory, we've done a few of these things b before each of us together and separately, and we all just said the same thing, this is going to kick off here. There was this kind of atmosphere you know what it's you like can you can feel it it was yeah. so nervy so tense they were all gathered around the roundabout um in one of the back streets of blackpool and there was just like so as i say a few score of people there and you can you can always tell because there will be just people kind of hanging around the periphery the perimeter who we were standing at a bus stop a little distance away just to kind of get the lay of the land and there were these two guys there two you know guys in their 50s bald kind of and they were just looking around, and they were waiting at a bus stop, but they weren't waiting for a bus. They were looking intently in every direction, constantly on their phones. Now, security was an ex cop and said, you know, look, they're just assessing the lay of the land, right? And they're giving instructions to everyone. So it felt like and there were people at the balconies waiting to see locals had come out to see what would happen. It felt like something big was going to go down. And there was this moment of like what I thought was going to be the start of the conflagration, where sort of out of nowhere, police van came along and they all got out, about half a dozen of them, and one of the ringleaders who had been kind of goading the police, they took him to the ground straight away. And it felt really dramatic, really quickly. And we thought, right, let's get over there. Us and the rest of the press who were there sort of ran over there. And then, really weirdly, it just sort of fizzled. There was still, like, the kind of shouts and the screams, and there was, you know, little kids screaming at them, going, you've got tasers, what have we got? You've got dogs, what have we got? Say lots of people mass. I mean, at one point, the, the scale of the victory was such that all they got, right, of this so-called civil war that was coming last night, was a couple of these lads just took over a roundabout, you know, in a sort of vindication of the kind of circularity of the far right's arguments, right? They just took, they took a roundabout, and that was it, and just held a flag aloft. And then sort of before you know where we were, that was it. 
And it was a really kind of weird evening. It felt almost as if there had been a sort of like gone up to the edge and yet all of the people there, such as they were, decided to step back from it for whatever reason. Well, we're going to hear from one of the people you spoke to in a moment, which, again, uh, I'm going to give the health warning now. There's some rough language. There's some pretty brutal sentiments expressed in this interview. But, I mean, if you just zoom out from where you were in Blackpool and go round the country, I mean, in Brighton you know, which is a very progressive city, it ended up that the police had to protect the far right because the far right was so... Is that, is that, that two-tier policing we've been hearing? Yeah, that's the two. Yeah, so right. the police had a line too thick around this sort of, you know, few dozen far right protesters who then had to scurry away into a building where they'd be safe, bless them. And then you've got the sort of situation in Walthamstow, a very multiracial area in northeast London, where it was thought it would kick off. There were so many people out on the streets that the the far right just didn't turn up. And you think, well, that's a victory for society and people coming together and a sense of community saying, we don't want you to smash up where we live. But it was also, I suspect as well, the effect of the very disciplined messaging that we'd had from the government and from the police chiefs around the country saying, if you're here to protest, fine. If you're here to cause trouble, we're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. And the government saying there will be swift justice. And we have seen swift justice. And that 69 year old bloke, the clip we played at the top of the show, never been in trouble before with the law at 69. He's going to spend the next two and a half years in prison. Yeah, I think it's talking to some of the police officers who were in Lancashire last night. I mean, they had, because it became clear, we went to a, um, we thought, well, maybe it's not kicking off here, but there was a sort of, some of them even came up to us and said, we're all going to the Metropole. You know, they actually told us, we're going to the Metropole Hotel, because this was a hotel on the seafront, which houses asylum seekers. And so we thought, well... well God, I've you... stayed there before. For Have you really? Conferences. Right, OK. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, it's on the seafront. It's a nice old hotel. And um, when we, so we jumped in a cab and we went there. And there was no one there either. And But there were kind of two or three police vans there, right? So this was, this was all intelligence-led. They were out in force and they meant to show force, which I think is part of the story as to why nothing really happened last night, because the kind of police were better prepared. But we were talking to some of the police officers there and asking them, why, why do you think it hasn't? Because on Saturday, Blackpool was one of the centres of real disorder, you know, in a really, really significant way. It was actually helped in the end, the police, by a punk conference taking place or a sort of punk kind of <laughs> taking place. Yeah, exactly. Like a collection of there were 10,000 punks in Blackpool last Saturday and they actually face down the far right and actually help the police clear up afterwards which doesn't seem very sort of anarchical and punkish but anyway they were there. but they, this police officer was saying that look you know the sort of word with the police is, is that we've got most of these guys you know we've, we've got 400 or so within that 400 that will contain some of the most sort of bawdy most aggressive sort of cantankerous characters that you can get the ones who are always at the forefront who are going for the police every single time and without them as kind of leaders of the movement it basically means it's harder to kind of keep coalescing around something and to keep gathering around something so the fact that as you say the police have, have now managed to in a sustained way arrest some of these guys and there has been swift justice has made an effect there's another effect as well frankly which which, which is um there is with these guys like there is only so much energy they have in the sense that one of the great misnomers or myths about this is right, a lot of these guys being motivated by some great deep sense of politics. A lot of them aren't. A lot of them are looking for a punch up, right? They're looking and they're looking drunk. for a bundle. Yeah, well, indeed, in every sense, they're drunk. They're often coked up. That's like the role of cocaine and the uh, mass availability of cocaine is actually a big part of this story, which I think has been underreported. And eventually, even with that, you run out of steam. And I think to some extent, that is what happened overnight. It would be different, you know, if they were actually, many of them, motivated genuinely by the vision of a burning city on a hill and had genuine zealotry, actually, then it might be different. But the fact is, most of them just want violence and the fun of the fair in that sense. Well, should we listen now to the guys you spoke to yeah. uh, last night in Blackford? But when it became clear that it didn't really seem to be going anywhere, look, we, that they came over to us and, and it, Initially, this guy in particular who was, I sort of hesitate to say it because I don't think it denotes anything, but just for the sake of context, you know, he was wearing multiple kind of England flags. You know, he was a clear, very aggressive guy. Clearly, I think he was drunk and possibly other stuff as well. But, you know, he insisted on coming over to me and showing me his phone. And his phone had a little sort of gif on it or a little image on it. It was obviously something he picked up on Twitter, which had a big circle around the continent of Africa. And it said, how is the 
population of this supposed to fit into the population of this with a smaller secondary circle, which you might imagine contain was just drawn around the map of the UK. And that got us talking. And this is the conversation, if that's the right word, that we had. Okay, now I got banged on a watch list because I, it was an MI6 website to go through fucking passport, there you go, new name, fucking everything, through Syria, into Iraq, shoot the fucking ragheads. And then they tried doing me for buying AK-47s. So, dark web, Facebook. What they need to do is do what they're fucking doing back in Ireland when I was there, fucking petrol bombs and fucking everything. Well, what? Bollocks to this. What, what, it, it, it's the immigra fucking immigration shit. But have you, have you done stuff like this before? Yeah. Do you ever yeah. come out yeah. protesting, yeah. rioting? Have you done it before? Protested. Protested. <laughs> Last week was the first one. It's been riled up for fucking years. So it doesn't say last week, on the last week protest, it was the police instigated the first part of the violence. Well, you would accept there has been a lot of violence around, I mean, yeah. and that a lot of people have been committed. Yeah, it's about enough. The average man's had enough. The government won't do nothing, so it's down to the average man to open the mouth. So what do you want to happen? Well, what, what do you want? To get see? them they planes. Need, need get, them, over to Rwanda, get them planes. Illegal. We're paying for fucking Rwanda. Get them planes, fueled up. Yeah. See you later. But who? Who do you mean? What, like asylum seekers or, or the illegals? All yeah. them that are coming on the boats. No more boats. Fuck them off. Get them all out of the hotels, right? That hotel, that hotel, that hotel, that hotel. There you go. Fuck them off. And is it just do it. illegal asylum seekers or is it people illegal? That... Illegal. So not legal. Don't, no, those that are coming on the boats. Yeah, right. Just them, not people who are the, already the, here. If, though, if those are here that are actually they're paying the taxes and shit like that, fair play. If they're paying into this country and everything like that, fair play to them. If they're paying their dues, tax, insurance, and shit like that. But those that come in the boat, fuck the boats off, get rid of them. And Starmer, he's a weapon. How do you mean what? How he's what? a barrister. He wanted them all in in the first place. The government should have sorted this shit out years ago. Yeah, but that doesn't give you the right to take it into your own hands. That's not how democracy works. I'm not a politician. I'm not. I'm not I'm a working class man. I tell you what, I'm classed as right wing because I'm standing up for this country because of you've got to think of your kids, your grandkids and everything like that. And, and these fuckers are taking over. And to me, bollocks to them. And, and look, John rightly gave the warning about that. Um, and, you know, you might be sat there thinking, well, why, why do we play it? And, and there is an argument around that. But I do think it is important to actually show when, when there are so many political actors out there or certain people who are trying to indicate that somehow like these people are representing like the working class or are representing ordinary people in some way and fighting for ordinary people in a way that the elites won't. I think it's important to hear actually unadulterated what their views are and what they're fighting for in their own heads and what they represent. Because as you just heard, I'm sure it would have abhorred every single one of you listening, that does not represent in any way or form the ordinary views of ordinary people in this country. That is one of the stories of the last week or so, and you can see that in all of the polling. Most people know what they see when they see it, which is a group of deeply xenophobic far-right thugs who are fighting for nothing beyond their own extremities inside their own heads. I think absolutely justified in playing uh, that clip because if you, you know you're not going to hear it on probably in those terms on a lot of main outlets because you know taste decency whatever it happens to be uh they would just kind of shy away from it maybe um i suppose the question we've got to ask now is where are we now is it calm from here on in and has the government been damaged at all by it or has the kind of latter toughness and decisiveness stood Keir Starmer in good stead. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because obviously we're sat here now on Thursday afternoon and it's possible that there are more, perhaps even tonight. Who knows? You know, by the time you're listening to this, there may have been further unrest. surges and yeah. unrest. So, you know, we, we can't know. Um, I think that in terms of kind of how Starmer has handled, uh, handled it, I think he's clearly handled it fine. If there's further disorder, then um, it will obviously be problematic. The only thing I've been a little, was a little surprised by actually, and I think this is kind of perhaps one of Starmer's, Starmer's potential weaknesses for the future, is the extent to which actually, although he's been seen, he hasn't been seen that much. And like, 
I was surprised that he didn't really turn up anywhere, any of these places, like, you know, that have been sort of been smashed in or whatever it was, particularly after the course of last, last weekend. And I think probably had it been Sunak, for example, and he hadn't done that, I think the narrative against him would have been more critical than it has been about Starmer. It's not to say that Starmer's handled it badly, especially, but I think it is part of Starmer's kind of, I'm sure, and I'm sure he's been working very hard on it, of course, as the Prime Minister, but it's part of his 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 belief, I think, that the most important thing for him to do as Prime Minister is to show and not necessarily tell. And I think that at some point that is going to be a potential weakness for him because actually the telling, particularly at moments like this, is actually really important when there are so many narratives doing the rounds. Although I guess the counter-argument to that is if you've got the police fully stretched and they're trying to do everything that they possibly can, yeah. that, you know, the Prime Minister turning up diverts a lot of resources away from what the police would be doing. I, but that was know. the Theresa May argument about Grenfell, wasn't it? She yeah, got a hell of a lot of stick. That, but that was a huge misjudgment. I mean, I think what matters now is, I think the, the, how I feel about where we are, let's just assume for the sake of argument, which perhaps is a big assumption, that th- there's no more disorder at, of any this level. Scale. No, yeah. no, for, for the time being. I suppose, you know, as I said at the top, decent people in Britain will be breathing a sigh of relief. But I don't think that we can be relaxed about where the far right is and about the future of the far right, because I think this these this last week has, I think, both sort of overestimated their strength, but allowed us to misunderstand their strength as well. Overestimate in a sense that, look, one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why they've dissipated quite quickly, there ain't that many of them. You know, it's looked like the, it's been huge and had such breadth because it's been in so many places. And when you watch it on the TV screens, of course... It looks scary, and of course, for anyone caught up with it, particularly for an ethnic minority, it is scary. But in fact, we're dealing with what, like you know, hundreds of people, maybe a thousand people or, or, or so. It's tiny in the sort of grand scheme of, of things. So their strength in numbers is not large at all or significant at all. But they do have a different strength, which I think is is misunderstood, which is that they have the ability to pervert our political discourse in really significant ways. And we've been reporting on this for ages. You know, they've been building up for ages. When we went to the Rotherham Hotel in February 2023, what were they doing? It wasn't just the unrest that was disturbing about that, as we reported on the show at the time. It was the fact that they were going around local streets, leafleting, putting misinformation, lies, conspiracies about what was happening there and about the people who were there saying they were murdering people and raping people and all of this sort of stuff, massively exaggerating things. They do the same with local Facebook groups. They're doing it on Twitter. And so they do have an ability sometimes to distort our political conversation. And it would quite help if, you know, because as we've discussed this week, it is important that because these people are capitalising on sometimes legitimate grievance that that people have yeah. around the country. And, you know, for example, I mean, I think politicians are going to have to really, and Starman does have to really grip the complete disorder of the asylum system because it is proving to be a breeding ground. It is toxic because it's injecting a toxin into our politics, which the far right are capitalising on. They should do all of that. But at the same time, particularly centre-right politicians like Robert Jenrick, as we've seen this week, need to be very, very careful about spreading kind of half-truths, misinformation, two-tier policing, all of this sort of stuff, because that is the, the oxygen on which also the far right thrives. So I think we need to be mindful yeah. of all this. I think the great temptation always, after you've had unrest and law and order is restored, to think that the problem has gone away and it's been solved. And I felt that particularly on after January the 6th uh, in, in Washington, where you suddenly see, you know, law and order is restored. There are no more, no more protests at the Capitol. But the issues that drove those people to attack the Capitol are still there. And the issues that drove people onto the streets, they may have been right wing thugs, but I think it would be a mistake and complacent and lazy for politicians to think that some of the views that they are articulating in an unacceptable way are not shared by many other British people about their concerns about immigration. And I think that, you know, the Labour government really, if it's serious about this, needs to be conducting a conversation that is about the benefits of immigration and about the downsides of immigration, about how you're going to tackle illegal immigration, about how the asylum system, if you said Lewis, is, is broken in need of it and what they're going to do. Because I do think the British people do need some convincing that there isn't a problem. Well, let's speak in a moment to the most prominent Muslim in Britain right now, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Well, I'm joined now by the Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, did you wake up this morning and kind of breathe a sigh of relief? Yes, 
look, I'm really proud of two things in particular. One is of our police service who have been working incredibly hard over the last few weeks. But yesterday, there were more than a thousand police officers just tasked with keeping us uh, safe. And these officers who normally, you know, take risks with their personal safety knew from what they'd seen last week in Whitehall, there were risks last night. I'm proud of them. But also I'm proud of Londoners who yesterday united in standing up against racism, Islamophobia and Islamism and came out in huge numbers uh, to show the far right that here in London were united. Has the danger passed? No, look, we can't be complacent. We must always be vigilant. We mustn't be as London as smug, thinking that what you've seen across the country can't happen in uh, London. One of the things that, that I've sought to do as, as the mayor uh, over the last eight or so years is to address the legitimate fears, uh, concerns that people in London have. And my, my unhappiness and anger is sometimes politicians don't address people's fears, they play on them. And what you've seen in the last couple of weeks is an example of playing on people's fears. And in London, there are people with similar fears that you've seen across the country, lack of decent housing, concerns about the uh, NHS, concerns about uh, not having decent uh, jobs and so forth. And we've got to make sure we don't allow the other, the asylum seeker, the refugee, the Muslim, to be blamed for that. You say there are legitimate concerns, but people say, look, the number of people coming into the country, the people being housed in hotels, asylum seekers, when, you know, poor kind of Londoners or wherever else in the country can't afford to go to those hotels themselves. And yet there they are on the state being fed and watered. Let's deal with those points in turn. Those were the same arguments used by Brexiteers before the referendum in June 2016. Look, the problems we have will be solved if we leave the European Union. Each week we will get £350 million to invest in the NHS. There'll be no more uh, immigrants coming because there'll be the single market will be gone, the customs union will be gone, it'll be the land of milk and honey. And many people who voted for Brexit will sell the pub. And it's the oldest trick in the book, John, going back centuries, millennia, dare I say, to blame the other for the problems. The reason why our schools are crumbling is not because of asylum seekers. The reason why it takes you so long to get an appointment with the GP is not because of asylum seekers or refugees. In fact, if we had more doctors from overseas filling the short-term problems, you'd probably get an appointment uh, sooner. Uh, the issue that we've got to recognise as a professional politicians is the fact that GDP is going up makes no difference to you if your quality of life is going down. We, as a, as a profession, uh, haven't always listened to the concerns people have, so we should be investing in the NHS, but making it more efficient. We should be recognising that you know schools that are crumbling are demoralising for those kids and they do less well in those uh, schools. We should be attracting investment into our country from uh, overseas. We should be having these conversations. Vacating the pitch means that others, you can name who they are, occupy the pitch and they believe wrongly those receiving these messages on social media or other forms of media that by targeting the asylum seeker, by somehow magically hoping the boats stop, it'll be the land of milk and honey. We've heard... In this episode, an interview that Lewis did in Blackpool with a guy who was former serviceman who is just furious at what he sees as the problems of people coming into the country who are making the country worse, making it poorer, affecting the uh, uh, access to housing and the rest of it, and does not understand why the state itself isn't doing more for all the talk. He, he's right to be angry at the lack of action from the state so for example question are we building enough affordable housing for that ex uh, serviceman answer no how we built enough council housing for people like him are we providing training for people like him to get the skills for the jobs that are being created we know in our city and across our uh, country did he receive the right care after he left the armed services did he get a thank you these are basic things the hard the thought of the immigrant or the asylum seeker that we've done badly as a nation. What about the complaint that there has been, and it has been picked up by certain conservative politicians as well, not just a complaint of the far right, that what we've seen in London, in other places as well, is two-tier policing, that the policing of a Black Lives Matter protest is very different from the policing that you would find at a far right protest, or in Birmingham, where you've seen policing of protesters who are mainly Muslim, uh, it's much softer than it is for the people who are protesting about immigration. Look, this is a device 
that's now been used by you know Yaxley Lennon, uh, Tommy Robinson, as he likes to call himself, and others uh, to try and engender a sense of grievance. Look, if you were to speak to uh, the women uh, who were policed in an appalling manner at Clapham Common during the vigil, they will also say there's two tier policing. You speak to many black Londoners or black people across the country who are disproportionately stopped and searched. They would also say there's two tier uh, policing. You speak to the families of the victims of Stephen Port. Uh, he killed uh, four gay Londoners a few years ago. They would also complain about two tier policing. That's why I ensured that Dame Louise Casey did a report into the Met Police Service, which found the Met Police Service, and by the way, other forces aren't different, the Met Police Service to be institutionally racist, sexist, and homophobic. So, yeah, I understand the concerns about two tier policing, but it's not from the angle you're coming from in relation to the grievance that's been raised with you. And I make this point, look, our police have operational independence for good reasons, and thank God for this. In our democracy, I can't tell the police how to police a protest. I can't tell the police who to arrest, who to charge. And thank God for that. What's next? Me telling the judge what sentence to uh, give. And the police do police. I, I've been there for eight and a half years now. Uh, I've not always got on with commissions of the police service, but to give them credit, they do police without fear or favour. You say you have no role in policing and you can't tell the police who to arrest. Let me put to you something that Robert Jenrick has said, Conservative leadership hopeful, and if things go right for him, he will be the leader of the opposition come November. He said anyone who shouts on the street, Allahu Akbar, should be arrested. I'm just disappointed. Angry? I didn't, I, I, I didn't believe that he'd said that until I saw the clip. I think he should, he should reflect on what he said. This is somebody who wants to be the leader of the Conservative Party. I pray five times a day, and I use the words uh, Allahu Akbar, or as you would know them, hallelujah, many times during the course of uh, the day. I go to churches all the time, and during the services, often the preacher will say, God is good, or God is great, and the, the congregation shout back all the time. Right? I go to gurdwaras and temples uh, and synagogues, often, the rabbis, the, the priests, uh, the, the, the learned scholars will talk about the greatness of God. I mean, hallelujah. Just think about it, John. And I just think, I, I just don't believe he actually means that. And I, and I hope that, that Robert will do the decent thing and apologise. We've also seen Elon Musk talking about how civil war is coming to Britain. What is your advice to Elon Musk? Well, it's not for me to advise to Elon Musk. When I see what's happening in France in relation to, you know, Germany, Netherlands, Argentina, uh, let's hope, if you're of my political persuasion, that the results in America in November uh, are a certain way. I'm, I'm really proud of the diversity of our country. I, every night I'm watching the Olympics and I see the, the wonders of our diversity, winning gold, silver and bronze uh, medals. And my nervousness about, about, about that sort of line of thinking is it feeds, into this, it feeds into a narrative of them and us, what he plays into that narrative of that's the reason why, you know, civil war is uh, uh, coming. I saw the comments about uh, two-tier uh, uh, care. I mean, this is playing to that sort of narrative I talked about, which is that grievance people have and playing on their... Uh, Fears. But Elon Musk doing this, is that dangerous? Is he dangerous? Well, look, it depends if people believe him. If they believe him, he's dangerous, right? What I think, what I'm more concerned about is not the personal views of the owner of X. What I'm more concerned about is the algorithms. What I'm more concerned about is they're not using AI to take down messages of hate, misinformation, disinformation. What I'm more concerned about is they, they removed staff whose job it was to take down these sort of uh, messages. Look, John, I receive on a daily basis so many messages of hatred on X including incitement against me. Um, so I'm at the receiving end of uh, this, you know, online crime is crime. The fact that it's online doesn't make it less of a crime. And I think that's where we should focus our energies, whether it's X, whether it's Facebook, whether it's um, YouTube, whether it's Telegram, the far right I know using Telegram. And I think, I think regulation is too slow to catch up with the evolution of social media. And I think, social, I say to social media companies, sort your own house out, please, because if you don't, the regulators will come in and it'll be less good for you than it currently is. Look, if you, John, or I, was to uh, do a, make a, sing a song that breached somebody's copyright, the AI would catch us out straight away because it's, you can monetize that or a breach of intellectual property. Well, what about hatred? 
because it's not monetized, you're just saying you're going to invest in it. That those are the sort of conversations I want to have with the social media platforms. It's not their personal views; they're entitled to their personal views. But but the way that Elon Musk is policing Twitter, and you know, he gave Yaxley Lennon his account back on Twitter and says this is about free speech. Is the way he is running Twitter or X a danger to democracy? Well, we saw with the elections in the USA in 2016 with Facebook. We also saw. Uh, in relation to Cambridge Analytica with our referendum in 2016, of course, you know, social media can be a threat to democracy. Of course it can. And we know the concerns that, that there were in our election, in the general election, and also my own mayor election this year as well. Thankfully, uh, you know, th those didn't materialise. What we do know, and I'm not bridging confidences, is that the Met Police Service are concerned that there are bots operated in relation to some of the amplification of the hatred we've seen in the last couple of weeks post uh, Southport and the misinformation. So we've got to be vigilant and cognizant of that. Sadiq Khan, you said a moment ago about the personal abuse that you have to take on social media and the kind of, you know, the stuff that comes your way. And I suppose that after you, the most prominent Muslim politician in the UK is the former SNP leader, former First Minister Hamza Youssef. He was with us on the news agents earlier on in the week. And I just want to play you what he said. You cut me open and I'm, I'm as about as Scottish as you come. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know whether the future for me and my wife and my three children is going to be here in Scotland or the United Kingdom or indeed in Europe and the West. I don't know whether you'd heard those comments, but he was saying the Islamophobia is now so bad that he doesn't know whether his family has a future in Britain or Europe. Do you ever think like that? I mean, I mean Hamza, who's, who's somebody who I've got a huge amount of respect for, is saying the same thing many of my friends who are Londoners, who are Jewish, have been saying for the last uh, few years as well, particularly the last uh, period. So I'm well aware of those sorts of views, those sorts of, sorts of concerns people have. And what broke my heart, John, yesterday, was my daughters being scared for the first time ever because of the colour of their skin and because they're visible Muslims. Uh, and I went through that, uh, the National Front, the BNP, the most recent incarnation, the EDL, and you saw, you, we've discussed in the past the sort of stuff I get on social media. But I thought I'd be the last generation who would get that sort of stuff because my kids could be more British, honestly, uh, or English, uh, or Londoners. Uh, you know, it's just, where would they go? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and the conundrum Hamza has, which my Jewish friends have, which I have, is where would we go, right? I say this though, London is, is different. I can't speak for Scotland or, or the rest of the country. London is different to me because there is no other city in the world I'd raise my daughters. I speak to my cousins who live in Pakistan who are ethnic majority and religious minority. I speak to my cousins who live in India who are ethnic majority and religious minority. And they say to me, listen, what you've achieved in London we couldn't do in Pakistan or India. Going from the council state I was raised in to being the mayor of this great city, that's not my brilliance. That's because Londoners have these values. That means they can elect someone like me to be their mayor. So the short answer is, no, I'd go nowhere. Uh, I'm the first in three generations of cars is going nowhere. My grandparents migrate from India to Pakistan. My parents from Pakistan to uh, London. I'm staying here, mate. Sadiq Khan, grateful to you. Thank you very much. Stay well. Thanks, John. You too. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast.